So that, uh, but then fanboys ran into some problems along the way. It was what, what was crazy is the movie ended up getting made um, by the Weinstein Company, the guys who started Rob Rodriguez's career and Quentin Tarantino's career um, and uh, Kevin Smith's career. Kevin Smith ended up being in fanboys. It slowly kind of grew from just a little indie film to actually getting made as a real movie. But along the way, it uh, ran into some problems. A uh, 40 year old virgin came out right then. It became the highest grossing comedy of all time. And so they tried to market it and change it. And actually, like they, once they started to test it, they decided maybe the dying friend thing was kind of a downer and we can cut that out. And they hired a new director to change the ending and make it so they were just going to break in because they wanted to see it early, which turned them into trespassers and changed the whole plot of the movie. Everything they tell you was going to happen when you meet you in Hollywood happened to me. I'm like, oh, really? They're going to ruin this? You know? And, um, but, and that would have happened. You can see they were trying to market. But this is what prevented it from happening. Star Wars fans have already seen the movie, and so they started to Photoshop Harvey Weinstein's head into a fat Darth Vader and call him Darth Weinstein. Go ahead. He is slicing the movie, you know, slicing the heart out of the movie because they'd already seen it. You know, we had gotten a standing ovation at a Star Wars conventions in LA and uh, one in London. So, um, and they saw that he was going to change it to make fun of Star Wars fans. And I was one of those Star Wars fans who was upset they were going to change it, you know, because I it was a movie about me and the friends that I had. Uh, grown up with. So, the, but the, what's crazy is that story of, had a happy ending. I heard the Weinstein Company ended up getting like a quarter of a million emails about a movie that hadn't even come out yet, that had just been seen at conventions. But it was like the first movie about what it meant to be a Star Wars fan or just to be a fan of something in general, uh, you know. And so uh, we ended up getting the movie back. This is Kyle Newman, who directed Fanboys, big, even bigger Star Wars uh, fan than me. That guy loved episode one. But he. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 he was like, he's like, you know, it may not be your favorite member of your family, but it's part of your family, dude. <laughs> like, oh, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> so, but that was the whole atmosphere on the set of, of, uh, of Fanboys. It was amazing. And uh, I remember bringing all my Star Wars toys to the set of the Fanboys, all nervous. It was filmed at Mountain Cookie. And I had brought my lunchbox and then my uh, land speeder that I had when I was a kid, and I took it to the prop guy, all nervous, and I said, "This is kind of weird, but would you put this is my Star Wars stuff uh, from when I was a kid? Would you sneak it into the movie?" And he looked at me for two seconds. He's like, "Dude, I've been doing that for weeks. My mom sent all my Star Wars toys here like two weeks ago. They're all over this movie." And, um, so he did that for me. You can I'll show you later where they hit it. In. But what's crazy about that is that once we finally got the movie back. I think Kyle called me and said, dude, we get to have our original ending, we get to do the final sound mix, they're going to give us access to the original Lucasfilm Star Wars sound library, so all the sounds in the movie are original you know, Star Wars sounds, and we get to do the final sound mix at Skywalker Ranch. Do you want to come? And so, this is me at Skywalker Ranch with Kyle Newman sitting on the front steps. It was crazy. They let me in. They told me they let me in. And they had, like, all the security guards... And people who worked there had seen early cuts of fanboys, so they knew that it was about. So when I showed up at Skywalker Ranch, everybody was uh, joking, uh, like, Ernie, uh, uh, don't steal anything while you're here. And I stole everything that was not nailed down. <laughs> like, if I don't know anything that said Skywalker Ranch, I was just stealing it. Uh, yeah, like a whole, they, they had kind of a miniature alcove that was like the archive room in the movie with like original Star Wars props and THX 1138 helmets and stuff from American Graffiti. It was. It was amazing, you know, I got to go and finish my Star Wars movie, which has Princess Leia in it, and Lando is in it, and Darth Maul is in it, and Captain Kirk is in it. I'm in the scene with Captain Kirk. He couldn't avoid me. On the set, I got to go up in, I had, even though I was wearing a purple Next Generation outfit, it didn't matter, I was gonna corner Captain Kirk and geek out on him, and I did. But, um, so it was like the most amazing experience of my life, and, but it uh, also like led to, uh, this, here's where my lunchbox is. If you ever watch the movie, you can see. This is at the Alamo Draft House, me forcing people to see where my lunchbox is, and now I'm forcing all of you guys to see where my lunchbox and my lunch theater are. But go ahead. Um, and uh, so this is a premiere. Uh, and we had it premiered initially at just like a few, like 14 or 18 theaters around the country, and then spread it, found its audio audience on video, I think. But now it's become a cult food movie, just like we always knew it would. This is our premiere at the Alamo. I love this little Chewbacca cosplay uh, kid in the back. Go ahead. Go ahead. And, um, uh, but that, so that experience of. Um, uh, writing fanboys, and I'm so still so proud of it. But when I ever I watch fanboys now, I just see all the stuff they changed and all the moments that they changed against our will that they added that make fun of the fanboys or make fun of the main characters that are, you know, characters that I created. So that experience is what led me to to write Ready Player One and see what would happen if I tried to tell a story directly to my audience with nobody, no producers, not worrying about budget or not worrying about it ever being a movie because I assumed it could never be a movie when I was writing it. <laughs> Because my initial idea was, you know, what if Willy Wonka had been a video game designer instead of a candy maker and he held his golden ticket contest inside his greatest video game creation. When I had that idea, like I 
latched onto it, and I wasn't sure if it would be a movie or what the idea would evolve into, but once I had the idea of all the riddles and puzzles and clues that he leaves behind, being uh, tying in with his own obsessions and his passions, his favorite movies, his favorite rock bands, his favorite music, uh, his favorite uh, you know schoolhouse rock cartoons from when he was a kid, all of that. Like suddenly, I had more ideas for riddles and puzzles and clues that I could ever use in one book. And whenever I sat down and was weaving in them in, into the story, it made it more fun for for me to write it. And so I wrote Ready Player One, you know, over like a long period of years uh, while I was writing a bunch of other screenplays. Sometimes I would set it aside for as much as a year at a time and get frustrated because it was such a big, sprawling, ambitious story. I wish that I had tried started something less ambitious than a giant, sprawling virtual reality epic with not just one planet, but millions of planets and a whole, uh, it was really ambitious and I wasn't, you know, but I was, I never gave up on it and I was always, um, uh, uh, determined to finish it because I believed in the idea and I wasn't sure what happened when I when I finally published it but my whole life uh, changed when it was published um, this is the paperback cover of Ready Player One it was a New York Times bestseller in hardcover and in paperback and they bought the movie rights before the book was even published there was a bidding war over the book rights and the uh, and the movie rights went to Warner Brothers right after I was finished it and I was sure it could never be a movie um, it went to the biggest movie studio in the world and Warner Brothers I feel really lucky you know, even back then when it was initially sold, because it was Warner Brothers and they had made all the Harry Potter movies, which are about as like faithful as you can get to so the source material while making changes that you have to make to make it a movie for a global um, audience. But my, you know, in that 48 hours, you know, when I sold Ready Player One, my whole my whole life changed, and uh, this was the first thing that changed was I was able to buy that DeLorean, uh, my awesome car, uh, with the uh, with the. But I always wanted to own a DeLorean. I saw one at a science museum in 1983. Before Back to the Future even came out, they had it parked at the Co at COSI, Center of Science and Industry in Columbus, Ohio. And we went there on a field trip from Ashland, and I it, they had it parked in the lobby, and it was 1983. It was the car of the future. And I just fell in love with it. And then a few years later, when I saw Back to the Future, which became one of my favorite movies of all time, then, oh my God, now it's a time machine, too? Then I definitely wanted to own <laughs> one. Uh, and, uh, and I never got over that. I always would, you know, uh, fantasize about owning it. Man, once eBay came around, people were auctioning off DeLoreans on eBay, I would look at them. But it always seemed like wanting to own, like, Kit from Knight Rider or wanting to own Magnum P.I.'s Ferrari. Like, something that would never happen, but until when I sold Ready Player One, I realized I could, you know, and I had to think about my book tour and my author photo, and I realized I could get a DeLorean finally, and I could use it in my author photo, which would be perfect, because it's an 80s time machine, which is kind of what my book is, and I could then also take it on my book tour around the country, and then it would be a business expense. And so, <laughs> it's totally a business expense. It was outside, selling books all day and pissing people off. Um, I, but uh, oh. so here, uh, so what I did was I recreated uh, Ecto 88, which is the car that a Wade, the protagonist of Ready Player One, drives. And he, since it's in the virtual world, and he's uh, you know fascinated and obsessed with studying the 80s. He isn't content just to have Doc Brown's time machine. He also mixes in the Night Industries uh, 2000 kit from Knight Rider, Doc uh, Brown's uh, uh, the time machine, the Ghostbusters Ectomobile, and Buckaroo Banzai's uh, jet car. So it has an oscillation overthruster and a flux capacitor to <laughs> travel through time and solid matter, it's really handy. It doesn't actually uh, do any of that good. Uh, and um, uh, so I ended up having a contest for the Ready Player One when the paperback came out, I revealed there's an Easter egg hidden in the print editions of the book. And then if you find it, it would lead to the first of three increasingly difficult video game challenges online, including a Stax uh, Atari 2600 game that some video game designers helped me make. It's described in the book, we actually brought the game to life. And if you find the Easter egg in the book, you can uh, you go to this website and it was the first of three challenges that you had to complete and the first person to complete all three of them during my paperback tour would win Well, I couldn't figure out anything about like a better grand prize than a DeLorean But I wasn't gonna give away my DeLorean <laughs> So I bought another DeLorean on eBay and I gave that away as the uh, Grand prize and that was the one that was the car that I drove across the country on my paperback tour So it was the grand prize DeLorean. It was the car that everybody could uh, uh, Had a chance to win and uh, the pr grand prize winner was the super fan a guy named uh, Craig in Kentucky who set a new world record on the Atari 2600 version of Joust. And uh, he had to send in a video to Twin Galaxies to get it verified, and I got to see the video too, and his, his kids just want the TV back, and he's like, no, I'm gonna win a car, he's been playing Joust. <laughs> like, Dad, you're not gonna win a car. He's like, no, I am, and he did, it was awesome. <laughs> on G4 TV, you can see the video online, and he's sadly giving him my second DeLorean. But uh, actually, two DeLoreans is too much. You only want one. Like Thanks. even one is kind of selfish. You two is asking for people to hate you. So, uh, uh, so then things started to get crazy once Ready Player One came out, both in hardcover and paperback. 
Um, uh, this is a kid who dressed up as my book for Halloween. Uh, the first year that it was out. So I was like, this is amazing. Usually you have to wait, you know, for there to be a movie for, but uh, um, uh, this is some fan art. This is some, uh, uh, that's actually going to be in the illustrated edition of Ready Player One uh, that they're putting out, as is this. Um, and this is a poster that it's, uh, artist Carlos Lerma in uh, Mexico made. Uh, you can go ahead again. And uh, uh, this is my favorite. Spoilers, don't look if you have a red, close your eyes. Uh, but uh, amazing, like the detail is so, that's the, one of the most amazing parts of Ready Player One going out into the world is like you imagine something as a writer in your head and then seeing artists like, and I can't draw a straight line with a ruler. So seeing like artists bring something to life is uh, uh, amazing. And at this level of detail, uh, this is amazing. Um, uh, it's just it's taking, taking a hot second. There, there we go. go. This is my favorite. This is the Russian edition of Ready Player One. They changed the title without asking me and made like huh. cyberpunked it out. I love it. It looks like a bad 80s VHS. <laughs> <laughs> this is something I never imagined would happen. Go ahead. Go ahead. That Ready Player One would be published in other languages, but it's been published in over 20 other languages now. I've gone to them. I'm Woo. crazy. I've, um, I've gone to Finland and Norway in Italy uh, to tour behind translations of the book and I, you know, first I was like, how does this book even make sense to any of you, you know? Uh, uh, but they made, made it clear to me that by the 80s they were playing our video games and watching our television and uh, reading our books and that like by the 80s American cultural imperialism was so pervasive that they had all the same <laughs> stuff that we did in the same stores in their mall and the same fast food restaurants so all of that stuff was not just America's pop culture in the 80s, it was a global pop culture and I've also discovered that kids uh, who weren't even alive in the 80s enjoy the book just because it works for them on a whole different level as a straightforward adventure story and the pop culture references wouldn't even matter if they were real or not it's more like the mythology in an Indiana Jones movie you know you don't, you know, you don't know whether all the stuff about ancient Mesopotamia is real but you know who the good guys and the bad guys are and also I've discovered that there's that like Ready Player One has been selected at over like a dozen colleges and universities as common read as homework where they make the whole incoming <laughs> freshman class read it. I promise you, I apologize anybody who's ever been assigned <laughs> as homework, that was not ever my intention. Or I never imagined that that would, that would happen. But like UMass Amherst, they remade the whole campus into like a three keys and three gates contest where you had to learn your way around campus as a new freshman as part of the... Uh, contest and they had mirror. It was crazy, and they invited me to come. They, I did, couldn't fly there with my DeLorean, not yet. So they, uh, they rented a DeLorean and brought it into the uh, stadium for me to get out of. But I had to hide in it before. It was weird. But um, <laughs> uh, uh, this is a tattoo that somebody got. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, I've seen a couple Ready Player One tattoos now. It's it's crazy. I'm afraid to even get tattoos. Uh, so it's like blows my mind a little bit. Go ahead. This is some Ready Player One cosplay. Um, uh, so uh, these guys showed up at Comic Con two years in a row. Usually, you have to wait for their movie to be cosplay. So it's pretty. But I saw a couple of anoraks. I, si I was signing silver eggs for guys in anorak robes uh, at Comic Con. It was pretty cool. Uh, more cosplay. Go ahead. This guy made a cool hoodie. Like there's any official Ready Player One stuff yet? So people are making their own, which I love. This awesome Artemis cosplay that I saw is probably one of my favorites. Uh, go ahead. And different people are getting personalized license plates from the characters. Uh, I've seen a couple of these. Go ahead. Um, uh, this guy. So like, and it keeps escalating. This is my friend Chell Lindgren, who is an astronaut, who is on in the uh, up on the International Space Station right now. Um, and he, uh, we met at one of my book signings in Houston, where he lives, where he was training to go up in the ISS. And he's a big fan of my book, and he gave me like a behind the scenes tour of. Uh, of NASA, this is me and they let me in mission controls. We have course in Skywalker Ranch. Like you guys do not want to let me in here. I'm geeking out hard. Go ahead. Um, this, this guy, I got to sit in Deke's chair. I was like, let's not make this problem worse by guessing. Uh, and so I, I, you would not believe the power of the DeLorean. At NASA, they freaked out about the DeLorean. People swarming astronauts who've been up in space. Oh, DeLorean! Uh, I'm like, you guys got spaceships over there. <laughs> Uh, they, they invited me into their virtual reality lab at NASA, and I was climbing around the ISS in the virtual. It made me sick as a as a dog, uh, climbing along the, the fuselage of the ISS. It was crazy that experience. And so, um, uh, but I will tell you that uh, Chell Lindgren. The amazing thing about him is he earlier this year, at the beginning of the year, he sent me. A, I got a clearance from NASA, and he's like, I hope it's okay. I want to take your the cover of your book up into space with me. So five days ago, he took the cover of Ready Player One up into space, and it's been up there all week. Oh my gosh. And he took the audio book with Will Wheaton up there too, and he told me he's been listening to it in space. I haven't told Will about that yet. Somebody tell Will that they're listening to his, his Ready Player One up in space. 
So this is Palmer Lucky and all the guys at Oculus Rift. And Palmer Lucky started his uh, uh, started his Kickstarter campaign for the Oculus like right around the time that Ready Player One was published. And everybody started recommending it to him, and he read it and liked it, and started recommending it to everybody at Oculus. And then eventually he emailed me. Uh, and said, your book is required reading here for everybody who comes to work, and would you come and do a book signing at Oculus Rift? So, and they, you know, uh, when I was writing Ready Player One, they didn't exist, you know, but they, the guy, these guys sent me a DK2, and so when I was writing Armada, you know, that's the difference, I had v VR goggles connected to my computer. That technological leap took place, you know, after I wrote my first novel about it uh, uh, <laughs> happening, these guys actually made it happen, and guys like John Carmack and, and Michael Arbrash, who worked there, uh, have all like credited Ready Player One as helping inspire them, which is amazing. It makes me feel like Arthur C. Clarke, like <laughs> this out. Um, uh, so this is me outside Doc Brown's house. I have my car in Los Angeles, and I could not resist. Um, that I, you're not supposed to park up on the bricks like this. So the guy ran out of the house. He's like, "What do you think you're doing?" I'm like, "What does it look like I'm doing?" <laughs> <laughs> that was an awesome photo of all time. <laughs> uh, the, buck, the gates to the Buckaroo Banzai Dam, the Sepulveda Dam, is usually locked, but this day they were not locked. They were doing construction just when I went and checked and I had Hector 88, so I just I held ass across that dam. They, this is the gates of the maximum security prison in Escape from New York, too, and they saw some They Might Be Giants videos. They shoot a bunch of stuff here, Gattaca. But uh, my favorite is the end credits of Buckaroo Banzai are shot here, and so I got to uh, park my my own jet car there very briefly, but then they like, you have to go. You know? <laughs> so, uh, so this is my super cute girlfriend who's running the slideshow, oh, wow. Christian O'Keefe afterwards. She is also, thanks, this is my best friend, my girlfriend, and she helped me all through this book tour, and uh, you're wondering who take all these amazing photos, it was her, uh, including this one. Uh, uh, this is David Fillion <laughs> geeking out oh, with uh, after waiting. Uh, that's right, Captain Mouse sat in my DeLorean every time I'm in there now. This, the reason he's wearing this crazy uh, prom uh, tuxedo is because it was Seth Green's 40th birthday party, 80s themed prom. Seth Green is oh. the, one of the biggest Ready Player One fans in existence, and he invited me to his 80s themed prom. And I'm like, I've got a time machine in Los Angeles. Can I bring it to your 80s themed prom? And he said yes. And so then this <laughs> happened. <laughs> Boom, <you> best friends. <laughs> There's no way he remembers this. But I remember this. Uh, Giovanni Ribisi selling point guard. Everybody, he was an avatar. He's like, oh my god, this is awesome. So it's amazing the power of a time machine. Uh, this is Seth Green. I gave him this book Rubanza headband for his birthday. And he said thank you. Uh, he's the nicest dude. When, so when they came out, so having DeLorean so much fun, they came out with a Lego DeLorean last year. My daughter and I built it and took this picture um, uh, in our driveway, so I'm, it makes me happy. Uh, this, you know what this is? This is two guys who aren't working on their next book. <laughs> online like yeah it looks like you guys are having fun <laughs> where's your next book Start it was working. so funny George saw I met George uh, at a convention in Texas A&M and he sat in my DeLorean and was so nice we made friends and then a couple months later he called me and uh, and he said you still got that time machine I'm like yeah it doesn't work there he reopened the movie theater in Santa Fe New Mexico where he lives and they show old movies like uh, and new movies and he said, we're going to show Back to the Future, and uh, I remember you have a time machine. I wondered if you would let me borrow it. And I said, can I tell people that you're borrowing it? And he said, yes. I'm like, deal, done. <laughs> so I let Jar Jar my my DeLorean, and then this happened. <laughs> right? yes, oh I my this God. George R. R. Martin McFly. <laughs> but, uh, and so uh, just the nicest guy, and so down to earth, and under, no, like, under the most pressure of any writer in the world. He, we went to breakfast the next morning, and... Uh, uh, and he said, thank you. He told me I had to get my DeLorean out of his garage because his Tesla was coming. Oh. So, um, he's like, now I'll drag race you. I'm like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> but, um, he, uh, uh, he took me to breakfast the next morning and we were making conversations. Like, so how your second, how's your second book coming along? And uh, I'm like, oh, so much pressure. You know, I got what I'm talking about. <laughs> Hollywood, you know, everybody's coming at me. You're like, I'm just, I'm not used to writing with all these expectations. And I look up and he's playing the tiniest violin. <laughs> I mean, he has, the, has it worse than anybody. He went to the uh, Emmys and they came down to his seat and put a typewriter in front of him. <laughs> Everybody laughing but George. <laughs> um, so this guy uh, is a huge inspiration for me. And right in the midst of all this, this is the pinnacle. I was already telling people that everything you could ever want to happen to you when you publish your first novel had happened to me. And then I found out who the director was going to be, Steven Spielberg. Woo! Like one of my favorite directors of never... 
it doesn't get any higher than that. When your name is synonymous with your job, then that's how you know you're really <laughs> kicking ass. Is he's like I never would have written Ready Player One if I hadn't grown up on a steady diet of Steven Spielberg movies and E.T. and Goonies. The whole reason I drive a DeLorean is because he produced Back to the Future. It's so crazy to me. Uh, and he has been a video game fan, you know, and he helped, uh, he's thanked in the back of Armada because his work also directly inspired my second novel, Close Encounters and E.T. Like that awakened my mind to the idea of life elsewhere and, and, and my interest in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. This guy, Carl Sagan and, and George Lucas. Uh, but he used to have a whole office uh, a whole room in his offices at Amblin, uh, back when he made E.T., devoted to early arcade games. Like a whole ar arcade, and his, he has been a video game fan and involved in video games ever since the beginning. And that's what's so exciting about this. Not only is it a chance for him to make a virtual reality movie in one of the first VR movies, but to make like the ultimate video game movie. And the examples that I would always use of people asking about the license, of how, how's the licensing already player one movie gonna work? The examples I would always use is the Lego movie, which Warner Brothers just made, and was able to have all these different licenses mash up together because they found that it just helps everybody involved. It's just more exposure and sells more Legos, yeah. uh, and uh, and it's also amazing. You know, Han Solo and like arguing with it. I just love that movie. Uh, but uh, and the other example is Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Uh, which the reason that happened is because the producer was Steven Spielberg who went to all the animation companies and asked them if they could do this homage and they all said yes because everybody would love to have their stuff featured in a Steven Spielberg movie so it's so strange it's all almost too perfect you know it's like the one person who could make a faithful adaptation um, is making it hmm. and so I'm so excited thank you thank you <laughs> and thank you guys for listening so that all kind of leads to me trying to shut that out. I mean, I found out the news about Steven Spielberg while I was finishing Armada, and I had to just, you know, and, and wasn't sure it would happen, you know, so any potentially good news in Hollywood is potentially disappointing news later, so I was trying to shut out all the success of Ready Player One and everything while I would write my second novel and get back to the place of that I was at with Ready Player One, which is trying to please myself. They tell you to write the book you've always wanted to read and to write what you know, and it was hard to get back to that place, but I tried to do it, and I will show you, I will tell you about some of the inspirations for Armada. Uh, this guy is a huge inspiration for our model. I wanted to be Luke Skywalker so bad from 1977 on. You know, uh, I think I dressed up as Luke Skywalker three Halloweens in a row. It was almost like movies and Buck Rogers and Battlestar Galactica and video games and everything that was coming at me was programming me to want to be Luke Skywalker. <laughs> and that's part of the idea of our model. What if that was the case? What if Star Wars and Space Invaders, which both hit me at the same time, like right 1977, 1978, I think the second time I got to see Star Wars, was the first time I ever got to play Space Invaders. It was one of the first times I controlled things on the screen. And uh, uh, go ahead, one more, this is kind of dark. And uh, this is so much my experience. Go ahead, these are kind of grainy. Uh, but playing Space Invaders, like the instructions are so simple, but so ominous. Uh, and uh, it, it was my first time playing a video game right after seeing Star Wars, and the two are always married in my mind. I remember imagining uh, that I was Luke Skywalker on his Death Star Trench run. I've since found out that Star Wars is the inspiration for Space Invaders, along with Star Trek, but a lot of early video games are, are um, an attempt by early, the earliest video game designers to recreate the feeling of seeing Star Wars, especially the end of Star Wars, uh, is a huge inspiration. Um, uh, this movie also hit me right around 1984, The Last Starfighter. Um, I love this movie. I was so I went and saw it like four or five times, and I was so disappointed there was never a video game tie-in to The Last Starfighter. I was what is the problem? This is the best. This is the biggest missed opportunity uh, ever. I since found out in my research that. Uh, uh, the prototype for the last Starfighter video game to try to replicate what they had done in the movie with a Cray supercomputer. It was going to be like $22,000 per unit. And there was no way to put enough quarters in any machine to <laughs> make a last Starfighter video game. So there never was one until the 80s, far much later, uh, like a Nintendo, very bad, not even made for, for the movie uh, ripoff. So there was, this is like a missed opportunity. But, but I sort of remember, once again, like I did with all the Star Wars movies, going down into the uh, arcade uh, in the lobby or to the, my local arcade and playing video games and trying to recreate that feeling and imagining that I was Luke Skywalker. Um, and uh, this movie also, Ender's Game, this is, uh, well, not this movie, but this book. Um, Ender's Game, thank you guys. Right, This is the first book that I ever read all in one sitting. I just could not put it down. I had to find out what happened to this kid, which is crazy. You read this book and it's like this experience of uh, years of Ender's life, you know, have come at you all at once. And it was such an immersive read and again, I found out that this was actually originally published in 1977, same year Star Wars hit, same year Space Invaders landed, it was serialized as a short story at Omni Magazine, and in the short story, as well as in the novel, Ender is, uh, part of his training is uh, simulations, like video games, uh, is part of his training. So it's interesting to me that almost as soon as video games existed, science fiction writers 
saw the potential uh, of them as training simulations. And uh, the other people that saw their the other people that saw their potential was the U.S. military. In um, uh, before I saw before I read Ender's Game and before I saw the Last Starfighter, I heard about this game Atari put out in 1980 called Battle Zone. And Battle Zone was a 3D tank game with vector graphics, and it was so immersive that the U.S. military saw its potential as a training simulator, and they bought it and paid the original Atari programmer to reprogram it into this, a prototype uh, that you can still that you can still play this game and see its gameplay online. It's called Bradley Trainer, and it was to train soldiers to operate the Bradley Fighting Vehicle, this new light armor tank that the Army had developed. And so, uh, in, as early as 1981, the U.S. military was modifying video games to train uh, the populace to, uh, uh, or to train soldiers to, to operate uh, in, for real combat situations. You know, the Marines did it again in the 90s with Doom. They uh, uh, reprogrammed Doom into a game called Marine Doom that they would use to train soldiers how to infiltrate uh, buildings and things. And now the most uh, um, uh, popular recruiting tool that the US Army has is a first person shooter called America's Army. Kids take their ASVAB and are tested on their uh, aptitude for the military, and then they play a first-person simulation of it. And a lot of like the most popular games are simulations of of, of warfare. Uh, this is go ahead and advance. This is more pictures. So this is George Luke. This is George <laughs> Lucas being shown the Star Wars video game for the first time. This is a big moment in my life. Um, this Star Wars video game was one of the first sit-down video games that made you feel like you were climbing into an X-wing. And some of them even had a little Walkman headphone jack that you could plug in your headphones and made you feel even more like an X-wing pilot. Oh my god, hours spent inside this game. Um, and uh, I've studied this game from all angles. Um, uh, but it was, like, you know, it was like a little, it was like a cockpit. It felt like a simulator. It felt like a starship simulator in a lot of early games like this one. Uh, the Vector Graphics Star Trek came out at the same time, and you would sit in it, it would make you feel like you were inside a simulator. It was like one of the, and this one as well, uh, Tail Gunner 2, I believe. Uh, and then the next one, there's a lot of them. But I found out my research, they, this is the early days, even before video games, back in coin-op days, mechanical video games, where they were trying to make, some, make flight simulators out of those. And there were flight simulators made out of wood, you know, as far back as the 20s. So flight simulation and creating a simulation of uh, military training is uh, goes back to H. Wells used to play war games uh, that simulated warfare. So um, uh, it, my brother, uh, the Marine, who's a major in the Marine Corps, ended up becoming an explosive ordnance disposal technician, and they used these kind of drones uh, to operate uh, to disarm IEDs and do things from a distance. And their uh, a lot of the controls that they use on these kind of drones, as well as aerial drones, look like video game controllers, and they do that on purpose because it lowers the learning curve for the soldiers who've grown up playing video games. And uh, we've all grown up playing video games. I feel like video ga playing video games is like a, na a natural extension of that from Space Invaders on. You sit and play a video game, you get really good at it. You develop all these skills and memorization and, and techniques and you be become second nature to you. And it's a natural thing to want those skills to have value or want them to have some real world uh, application. And it always makes me think of that idea of that scene in Karate Kid, the wax on, wax off scene. He's been scrubbing a deck and sanding a floor forever. He doesn't realize he's been learning karate. That's my initial idea of like the idea of playing video games to train you to operate drones. Because now if you, which you can get very cheap drones. I have one, I think, in my pocket. They cost, uh, it's crazy. Dr little drones now, you can get for $20 uh, and they fit in your pocket. I'm probably gonna hit somebody in the eye, watch out. <laughs> But they don't cost anything. <laughs> right? I write I have one I'm mounted in that two eighty eight because I get stuck in traffic, I can raise the drone and find out how bad the traffic is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a problem on Star Wars, uh, The Force Awakens, it's a problem now. They had a problem with drones flying over and taking pictures of the Millennium Falcon. That's how far we've come uh, uh, with technology. So that um, idea, go ahead uh, in advance again. So uh, that idea of uh, video games being used to control drones um, uh, came from, uh, and the idea of doing an alien invasion story came from a lot of different movies. Usually for people it's like this, uh, like most stories, I think for a lot of people are, it's this meets this. For me, it's like this meets this meets this, 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 and this, and so I'm going to show you guys. Uh, this Close Encounters uh, was, had a huge effect on me, like I said, E.T. as well, uh, also this. Uh, and these Heinlein's uh, Juveniles, the, the books that Robert Heinlein wrote, um, uh, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, Have Space Suit Will Travel, I just devoured all these books, you know, these space-faring adventures, and along with Star Wars, it was like an extension of my love of Star Wars, led to my love of science fiction. 
Um, uh, this, and I also love movies where kids can do anything, or stories of kind of epic heroes' journeys, which I found in you know, studying Joseph Campbell, that it's always kind of a young person who is called to adventure out of their village uh, to go off and save the world, like Ulysses or Perseus. Uh, and in this movie, this kid uh, finds out that they're building nuclear weapons in a secret lab outside of his hometown of Ith Ithaca, New York. So he breaks in, steals some plutonium, and makes a nuclear bomb for his science fair. Uh, and it's, to my mind, it's like a sequel, and then like almost a sequel to War Games. It has that same kind of feel of this kid's trying, just trying to download some games, almost starts World War III. <laughs> but then he prevents World War III, so it's okay. Um, uh, next one. Uh, so um, something else I wanted to leave in, uh, leave in the story was the legend of Polybius. How many people know about Polybius? No one knows about Polybius. Or so I bet some people do. So, uh, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. Everybody has their own uh, pronunciation. But Polybius is an urban uh, an urban legend uh, that was uh, existed about a video game that was kind of a mind control video game that would the kids who played it would have a strange effect on them and. Um, and that there were men in black showed up, showing up at arcades, and then the, uh, that would download scores from the game, and then it vanished, would vanish forever. So I've kind of uh, woven the Polybius legend uh, into my, my novel Armada and sort of added to it and made it part of this conspiracy. Go ahead. Um, this movie also, Iron Eagle, um, uh, is one of my favorites of all time, and uh, no one thinks that this is a video game movie, but it's one of the greatest video game movies ever. This kid, uh, an Air Force brat, learns to fly an F-16 by cutting class and sneaking into the base flight simulator, which is basically the coolest video game of all time. And then his dad gets shot down, uh, and uh, he has to go and rescue him in, in a real F-16, and his computer hacker friends help him steal a couple F-16s, and he and Luke Passage <laughs> Jr. go over to uh, bring him back. But the great thing is, Kind of like a kid going to the arcade, he is always used to listening to his Walkman whenever he's in the flight simulator, so he needs the music of Queen and Twisted Sister blasting at all times where he sucks as a pilot. So he, he's not rocking out uh, like montage style. So I love that, and it's such an experience of like me going to the arcade, uh, and my brother too, we would make our special mixtapes and go to the arcade uh, to rock out. And then I think that was like as a tribute to Iron Eagle. Um, uh, this is Doug's special Walkman that he straps to his leg in Iron Eagle when he goes up and uh, and... So a lot of this, there's a mixtape actually at the back of, uh, uh, hidden at the uh, back of Armada before the uh, acknowledgements, and it has a lot of songs from uh, both, you know, that I would listen to back in the 80s when I was going to the arcade, and songs that are mentioned in the book, and also songs from soundtracks of movies that helped inspire uh, uh, this story, which, some of which I'll show you. Go ahead. Like Explorers uh, is another movie. These kids uh, start receiving alien technology and build a spaceship in their backyard and fly off to meet aliens. <laughs> Ethan Hawke and River Phoenix and this other kid. <laughs> uh, Top Gun. Uh, Top Gun, everybody went to see uh, in the 80s. And if you look at the naval recruiting figures for the, uh, in the 80s, it's like the release of Top Gun, and boom, it shoots straight up. So many people wanted to be naval aviators and fighter pilots because of this movie, and even this movie, along with Rambo, would get accused of being almost war propaganda in the 80s because of the effect it had on military uh, recruitment. So that kind of taught me early on that pop culture could be used to influence people, and the idea of like, oh, what about this alien invasion, and everything from Star Wars on, as long as like as well as War of the Worlds and Independence Day and all the uh, you know kind of alien stories about extraterrestrials and alien invaders, if that actually happened now, you would have all these preconceived notions about how it would go down. We would be not quite prepared for it, but prepared for it more than if we'd never the idea had never crossed our mind. It's almost you know pounded into us. You're, you've been aware of the idea of alien invaders you know since you were little. Um, uh, this movie also, Flight of the Navigator, this kid uh, gets hold of an alien <laughs> spacecraft. A little older than this kid. Gets a hold of an alien spacecraft and takes off. Go ahead. Uh, and The Goonies, probably the greatest kids could do anything movie of all time. I was heavily inspired by stories like this, again, produced by Steven Spielberg. Um, and but also, go, keep going. Let's go, go ahead, keep going. So these are different. Uh, uh, these, uh, well, I also wanted to tell a story about, you know, uh, that was aware of all the alien invasion and ace fighter pilot movies uh, beforehand. There are a lot of ace fighter pilots, and there are a lot of uh, uh, they have a lot of ace fighter pilot spaceships. Um, uh, and so I wanted to like pay tribute to all of that, but also put my own <laughs> spin on it. And the idea behind Armada that, that I think uh, makes it unique, that's kind of different, is the idea of drones married with something that's actually like the rise of drones in our military. I saw they were going to make a sequel to Top Gun finally. Uh, with Maverick, but Maverick is going to be a drone pilot in it because that's where our military is going. So, and seeing my brother use drones, like that idea married with the idea of quantum data teleportation, the idea of using um, Einstein's, this also, uh, use that so, let me uh, mention, this is not me, but this is a kid who's sending in 
to get an Activision patch. Back in the 80s, you used to be able to uh, send in a picture, a Polaroid of yourself with your high score, and, they, and Activision would mail you back like a reward patch for that game. And in Armada, that's part of the grand conspiracy to get the photos and home addresses of all the best gamers yeah. in America. So if you ever got an Activision patch, you would be uh, uh, a part of the conspiracy. <laughs> but but so, so that idea of making all of pop culture and, cut, and the video game industry uh, be created to help prepare our hearts and minds for an alien invasion. That was like an idea that had been brewing. But once I married that idea with the idea of controlling d drones with quantum data teleportation, which is lossless data teleportation, meaning if we sent that probe to Pluto using this, we wouldn't have had to wait like an hour for radio signals to get there and back. We could control it and it would be like a telepresence robot. And once I had that idea, it made me see Star Wars differently. Now when I watch Star Wars, I wonder why can they have real-time holographic phone calls between planets with no lag at all, but they can't make a remote control X-Wing or TIE Fighter, uh, they definitely could. You know, there's no reason to now to send Porkins down to die on the Death Star. He could be back on the fourth moon of Yavin using a PlayStation controller to fly that X-Wing and uh, take, you know, send ship after ship. So that idea of the video gamers of Earth, um, and that, so that makes me think about alien invaders like War of the Worlds and Independence Day. Why would they send people down in, organic beings down in ships to die when they could send drones remotely. So the idea of alien invaders using drones and the people of Earth using drones to defend them, as soon as I had the idea of all the gamers of Earth using uh, all their gaming skills that they've acquired over the past four decades and all of their Xboxes and tablets and phones and Playstations and Nintendos to control these drones that had been hidden around the world to fight off the alien invasion, I realized it would be uh, sort of an alien invasion video game war where the outcome is decided by the gaming skills of two civilizations. And as soon as I had that idea, I got really excited because it was not something I'd ever seen in Star Wars or Ender's Game or The Last Starfighter. I wanted to pay tribute to all those, but also use the idea of like just kid, the idea of kids using drones hidden around their neighborhood to def like, and their at the Nintendo's uh, consoles to control those drones and defend their own neighborhood. As soon as I got that, I that idea, I got really excited and I was able to kind of shut all, out all the success of, uh, and everything that was going on and focus on this story, which now is done and you guys have all have it in front of you. Uh, go ahead. Uh, and thank you so much for listening to Ramble. Woo! Woo! Talk to us all around. You guys know everything about me now. I will take a few questions, a burning questions people have, and then I will uh, go start signing books. Uh, who's you, sir? Um, I saw in an interview that uh, Ready Player One was supposed to be a lot bigger. I'm kind of curious what a uh, easy got uh, scrapped. No, I didn't scrap anything. That book is the perfect length. I wouldn't uh, change uh, anything. I, well, you know, actually, at one point I did have an idea of there being seven keys and seven gates, but it was a little too complicated, so I took some of those ideas and set them aside. And I might use them in Ready Player One. Two or Ready Player Three, uh, when I ever get, I get around to writing those. People always ask if there will be sequels, and initially I just wanted it to be a standalone story, um, but uh, through the course of writing the screenplay for Warner Brothers and touring behind the book and having people ask me about sequels, I've since uh, mapped out what would be uh, parts two and part three, and I registered ReadyPlayer2.com and ReadyPlayer3.com so they wouldn't turn into porn websites. <laughs> <laughs> The Spanish edition of Armada? Oh, I know, right? What, what, what will happen? I think maybe they might give it a different title, like Quest, like they did with the Russian edition. Maybe they'll make it look like an 80s VHS movie as well. You young lady. Where did you get your inspired for some of the characters in Ready Player One? The inspiration, she's asking where I got the inspiration for my characters in Ready Player One. They were, uh, they say when you write a novel, you kind of reveal everything about yourself, and so there's a lot of me and the characters, but also people that I grew up with, and I spent a lot of time going to gaming conventions and comic book conventions and Gen Con and uh, things like that. So I and I love to hang around people who are geeky people who are enthusiasts, I call them, people who like love something so desperately that they just can't hide it, and they want to tell you about it, and they want to make a website about it, and they want to cosplay, and they want to like share their love. You know, people who are just enthusiasts for things. So I end up writing about uh, people who are that way. End up, you know, their personalities stick with me, and I end up weaving them in, into the story. So no one person is really. Uh, based on any uh, anyone other than I would say James Halliday, the eccentric billionaire. He's a little bit Willy Wonka, but he's also a little bit Howard Hughes. 
uh, and also a little bit of Richard Garriott, a local Austin game designer, who I don't know if you guys know this, but he helped to create all the uh, Ultima games. Pretty much the first guy to put Dungeons and Dragons in a computer with the Calabeth and then Ultima and created the MMO uh, here in Austin. And he also um, uh, wanted to be an astronaut when he was a kid and uh, couldn't pass the physical, so he made millions becoming a video game designer and then bought a ticket into space and went up in the International Space Station <laughs> with his video game money, right? He also had a mansion outside of Austin called Britannia Manor. You can see tours of it online. He used to open it up as a like a, a haunted house at Halloween would have people all of Austin would come out and go through his house and he would hire actors and fire eaters and people to make it like a live action Dungeons and Dragons adventure. So he was a huge inspiration for uh, for the character. Like it showed me like what a like a, a creative geek could do, you know. Uh, and he brought and, and brought and brings so much joy to people in the process. So thank you so much for that question. I'll take one more question because I feel like a lot of people want to get their books signed and go home. And, when, and let me, while I remember, if anybody has kids and has brought kids with them, then they get to go to the front of the line. Like, that's cool <laughs> with everybody. I have a kid, so that's a good thing. Um, uh, one more question from someone young, a young person, the young people have a question. You, sir. Do you think Spielberg will pull a hobbit and make Ready Player One the top of the JT Crystal Key? Uh, no, I don't think he will pull a hobbit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that, I love that term, though. I'm going to start doing that. I'm gonna leave that alone. Um, but uh, you know, I uh, um, I feel so lucky. He, I, like I said, I never could have written either of my books if I hadn't grown up seeing his movies. I feel like he's one of the best storytellers of all time, and um, arguably the most successful filmmaker in the history of cinema. Thanked more than God at the Oscars, I'm told. <laughs> so he's had such a profound effect on cinema as we know it. And this is like a tipping point where virtual reality is going to become a huge part of the way we watch movies, the way we report our wedding, our graduation, and rock concerts. It's a whole different experience when you're not composing for a two dimensional window anymore. It opens up a whole different kind of entertainment for, uh, for video games and for movies and television, it's a really exciting time, and that's all about to happen much faster than I think I imagined it in Ready Player One, and I think he's, I'm so excited that he's a part of that. It's, I, I tell people that it's like Vanilla Sky or an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, and that I must have died a few years ago, and I'm just making this all up in my head, because it's just too perfect. But So uh, I think it's gonna be amazing. I, it's like a dream come true. I hope you guys think so too, it's amazing. Thank you guys so much for listening. Woo! Woo! I will see all of you upstairs.